So Great welcome, to meet welcome to the webinar. Um, I'm Deborah Gallant from Entrepreneurs Forever. Today's um, Forever Forward program is going to feature a member, Phil DeMuro from Founders Approach, is a member of our Rhode Island group, which I facilitated for a while, and now you have the capable Shelly Carduz uh, facilitating it. And um, I was always impressed in my early interactions with Phil about how he could like, oh, I know about that when we would come up with technology. It's like, he knows a lot. So he'll tell you a little bit about what his business does in the context of what we're doing. But when I come up with these programs, these forever forwards, I'm like, what are people talking about? And what I hear is, I heard there's another technology tool I need to use, but I don't know how to know if it's really right for me. And that's how I came up with today's topic. So Phil's going to talk about things you can address with technology, the tools he likes, the other tools he knows about. And at the end, we're going to leave time for very specific questions. So if you want to know something, save it to the end when we're not recording. And uh, hopefully we'll have time for Phil to answer your questions. So I am going to uh, share. You probably don't want to see that. You might want to see this. View slideshow. All right. If I start at the beginning, that would probably be best. All right. Good morning. Forever Forward today, technology tools for your small business with Phil DeMuro. We're going to do um, introductions of me and Phil, talk a little bit about what Entrepreneurs Forever is, do the presentation, and then some recap and sharing. Um, so that we're a small enough group. So um, Jamal, do you want to introduce yourself? Good morning. <laughs> I am Jarmel Fairclaw. I consider myself a gift creator. I am the owner of Mel's Gifts and Party Planning. We create uh, gift baskets, gift items, and custom events for any and all occasions. Nothing is too big or too small. That's great. Did you come with a specific question or topic that's been bothering you about technology? Oh my gosh, yes. <laughs> so it has been very difficult to connect with other gift basket businesses. So my main goal for today is to really listen to see what others are using and see how I can integrate it into some of my processes. Great. And you should also know we're doing a speed networking coming up in December with all of the Entrepreneurs Forever members. So you'll be able to meet more, including gift people. Yes, thank you. Uh, Terry. Good morning. Good morning all. I'm a facilitator with Entrepreneurs Forever. Also have my own small consulting company, uh, Boss Consulting, uh, specifically working on supporting the human side of leadership, uh, the stresses and strains it takes to be an entrepreneur. Um, I thankfully had a cancellation this morning so I could pop in because I want to see what's going to be shared so that I can share it with all the other pods and groups to help them uh, solve their problems. Fantastic. Thanks, Terry. And Greg uh, Rusak is an entrepreneur, an Entrepreneurs Forever facilitator in training. We're doing the training next Tuesday. So he's joined us for a couple. Do you want to introduce yourself, Greg? Uh, sure. Thanks, Deborah. <clears throat> Good morning, everyone. Uh, as Deborah said, I'm Greg Rusak. I am a uh, sales strategy process and leadership consultant to B2B startups and emerging companies who need to take the guesswork out of forecasting sales. I'm really thrilled to be uh, coming on board as uh, one of the facilitators, but I'm here because technology just keeps moving forward. And if we don't, we'll get left behind. And so, yeah, Phil, I, I, I probably have more questions than I even I could vocalize, but thanks. Thanks, everybody. Nice to meet you all. So, yes, and you will find more questions as you go along. So save them for the end when we don't record and we'll we'll let you um, ask them then. Cindy, welcome. You're a regular. We love to have you on our webinars. Thank you. I like being here. So, um, and obviously I need tech help. I can't even get on the webinars. So um, I'm sorry I'm late. I was trying. You can ignore that email I sent you, Deborah. <laughs> So I'm Cindy Verselli. I live in Pittsburgh. Um, I'm a painter. I paint animals and I'm focusing on dog portraits right now. Is that what did you I missed the part where yeah, we, it was just meant to do you have a specific question about technology? Oh, I, 
I don't even know where to start. So I'm here to learn everything you have to offer. All of them. Okay, great. Terrific. So I believe most of you know who we are. Our mission is to empower all business owners to grow their thriving businesses that sustain their families and support their communities. I don't think it's relevant here, but we have the weekly business boost that people can learn more. I always like to tell you what the next upcoming learning <laughs> opportunities are. The next deep dive is on exiting your business. Um, because you have different options other than just walking away and you should think about them in plenty of time. And then there's one with another member, um, Ashley is gonna present on grants for small business on Friday, November 8th. So big, big proviso. This presentation does not take the place of professional advice from your own paid advisors. Please don't come back and sue Phil and I when you say, I tried to install HubSpot and all it did was make me lose four clients. Not my problem. We're here to share information and hopefully be of great use, but please don't hold us to it. So again, today is about technology tools. I'm gonna stop sharing, but I do wanna um, just set us up. Uh, Phil is just so capable in terms of his broad knowledge of all the things going on in the tech world. He's not gonna convince you all you need to build a mobile app. He's gonna try to help us understand when we have small businesses, which tools are worth it, which ones aren't, which ones are overkill and how to use them without making yourself crazy. Cause sometimes they're just bright, shiny objects. So without further ado, Phil, do you want to talk a little bit more about your background before you go to share your deck? I mean, I love the transition that from, from our end, I think you hit the nail on the head. And I, I love that this group is all across the spectrum from, it sounds like people that are very much so, you know, in an early stage, don't really know necessarily a lot of tech tools to use. And then ones that are probably using a lot of them on the daily basis. And, and I, I, I am excited to go in through it because from my end, yeah, it's because I'm kind of a hobbyist in the space. You know, on the day to day, I, I run a software development agency building apps and websites, but to run that business, I need to use all these tools or a bunch of these tools myself. So a lot of it, my goal today is just pass on the information of me struggling through the YouTube videos, watching like, what are the best project management tools to use? And, and what's the pros and cons of HubSpot versus Salesforce? And those are kind of the things that we'll get into a little bit today. And I want to save time at the end for us to jump into maybe some specific tools that you're using and some questions if I have some experience with it. All right, you're up. Thanks again, Phil. Perfect. I did a little presentation. Feel free if you do have like individual questions to jump in or raise hands. If I don't see anyone in the chat, just let me know, okay? Um, I'll, I'll monitor the chat so you can focus on the presentation. Um, Phil's also uh, sharing his slides. So if you wanna go back and revisit them later, and of course you always get the recording if you wanna revisit something later. Yeah, and to kick off, right, it's really endless. I think that was one of the things a lot of founders get scared by is there's so many options nowadays and they're really afraid they're going to pick the wrong one. So I came up with these kind of guiding principles that I use, which is, you know, these four ones, leverage free as much as possible. I can tell you we run a business for eight years now and there's actually very few of the softwares that I use on a daily basis that we actually pay any absorbent amount for. Uh, we, we're on free tools for the vast majority of them. So don't be afraid. If you, The more planning you put into which tools you use, the better chance you are to stay with that tool long term. Um, that goes into the second point, which is don't get locked in. A lot of times if you get stuck in a platform because you've been using it for so long, well, you, you know, when you do have to jump to the paid tier, it can get really expensive really quickly um, if you didn't pick a plan that kind of scales with your business. Um, I try and use these tools. Why, why do I use them? Because they help me essentially automate parts of my business and remove uh, silos of information. So a lot of times, if, uh, for example, I'm taking notes after a meeting with like three other people, but I'm writing notes on a piece of paper in front of myself, those notes aren't shared. No one can easily find them. And if I go on vacation and someone needs some of that information, they're, they're, they're not going to be able to get it. So our company runs with developers in three different countries, uh, team members in three different states. Uh, so we have to have all this information kind of inside of uh, tools to make sure that we can utilize and find information when, when we need to. And then essentially the last piece is just avoid similar tools. I find a lot of times founders are using three different tools to do video calls and it doesn't necessarily help them uh, in their business because it's not like there's a centralized database of you know all the recordings they've ever had. So I try and avoid similar tools. 
And the way I do that is I break them into categories. So I'll kind of kick off with project management is one of the most uh, important ones for my business. And it's just a way for me to basically jot down. I, I use it for a few things. One, I jot down my own personal notes from meetings and things like that. I have my own to-do list. I operate there, but then I convert those into actual, um, uh, I'll show you the tool I use, but actual uh, Trello boards where that entire project is run from that one board. So I think of project management for my personal side, but then I also use it as our entire business would. And these are some common ones that you may have heard of before. Sana has been around a long time. Really great tool. Basecamp is another great one. Uh, Monday is uh, boomed Jira and Trello. To give you a quick overhead about some of these, um, what I like to say is Asana and Trello are kind of similar in how they're structured. So if you like how they're structured, I'll show you that in a second. Those are kind of similar. They do have a pretty good pricing tier for 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 it. Uh, Basecamp is a unique spin on its one. So take a look and see if you like how it's set up. Monday is kind of more corporate, right? Monday, in my experience, has been, um, if any of you are familiar with Gantt charts, it's a uh, you know, there's, you have multiple team members that have overlapping schedules and you need to schedule them out. That's where monday.com uh, comes in really helpful. And then Jira is great, uh, but Jira is another project management tool, but it's it's really been built out of the development ecosystem. So if you're working on software projects, I recommend a tool like Jira. If you're not, I would stay away from it because it can be a little overwhelming from, from that perspective. And the one I use is Trello. And the reason I love it is it's just meant to be a very simple to do, doing, done style. They call it Kanban is the, the official name for it, but it's post-it notes. If you've ever seen people historically putting post-it notes into columns for to do, doing, done, Trello is the simplest version of that. And I use it for our project. So whenever I kick off a project, if any of you are in client work, I heard a few of you are, maybe you'll have a default board. And this is where I have all the things for our projects, like security reminders. There's there's basic checklists that I need to do for all of my projects. And I do, you know, because I have that, I, I have want every single one of our projects, no matter who's who's the project manager from our company doing it, I have that set up. So I can just make a copy of this every single time. But then I also even use it for my own personal one that none of my team members have access to. But this is where I have my to do, doing, done items for for what's coming up for myself. And when I go into do anyone, I'd be curious if drop in the chat if you use any uh, of project management tools. Because while I'm going along, I'd love to at the end come back and look which ones you're all using because I think that'll guide the conversation. So let me ask you a question. If you can go back to the one before this. So I know that there are a fair number of our members who are using Monday, but yep. my understanding of how they use it as a full business management tool, it's not what you how you classified it as project management yep. because it does things like invoice clients, integrate with QuickBooks and stuff. You know, what's totally. the difference between picking, I, I know you use the word silos, but picking something that does project management as opposed to something that tries to run your business? What I'd like to say is a lot of these tools, I think, can do both, right? So in my mind, essentially, I think of I work because I do a client work and I need to recopy these projects or um, constantly the, the Trello system and the copying system works really, really well for me. But then the things like inside of Monday, uh, you can do these scheduling uh, uh, concepts that you just can't get inside of Trello. So I would take a peek at the different tools and I always kind of look up this tool versus, uh, and then if you just type that into Google, you'll see the next three ones that come up. Let me drop this away so you can always see this too. Am I missing the I disable? I'm still just seeing your project management slide. Oh, yeah. Do you see? I want to show you the names underneath it. Do you see that as well? Yeah. The, uh -huh. mm -hmm. Oh, got it. I have the thing. So so essentially the way, way I think about it, you can definitely run your entire company from it. And then like what you what I would say is find out if there's a tool, for example, like Trello, because we're in we, we want our clients to be on that Trello board with us. We invite them to it so they, they can always check in on the project. And the thing I think about these is this is essentially my my ability to dump my to-do type of tasks onto this board so then I don't have to remember it, right? The idea is 
your brain is a finite resource at the end of the day. And there's only so much space in there. And the more that I can drop on this Trello board so that I don't have to, I can, I can come back to it two days later and still see it. That's what I kind of look for is making these places, the home base for a lot of stuff. And then I have a second tool that we'll, that we'll go into next that is more the hub of communication, right? So this is for me, you may have heard of a lot of these tools before. Microsoft Teams, love it or hate it. There's definitely, uh, it's taken over over the last couple of years. ClickUp and Slack, I find, are uh, similar uh, when they come to, you create a channel where all the communication can happen. So like, say you run a social media marketing business, you could have a channel for each one of your each one of your clients, or maybe you have a channel for, uh, for each one of your social media uh, uh, outlets that you're doing, like a Facebook channel, and all of your content gets put into there. I think of these hubs in Trello, or these hubs and these project management tools as how to create a digital home base for your business, essentially. And then I even put on Discord, which I don't know if many of you are familiar with, but essentially is it's very similar to Slack, but it was really built for video gamers in the early days. And it's really expanded since then. A lot of companies are now using it more and more. A lot of social communities are using it. A lot of times I see founders who um, you mentioned the gift giving uh, business, right? You might have a hub uh, on Slack where all of your past events, all the, the people that hosted it are all in the same communication. They can just post fun, engaging content and you create and build some sense of community there. I had my, a good friend of mine was also the photographer at my wedding and she used Facebook groups for this where she put all of her past clients into one group so they could share ideas and chat and communicate. And it was a good way for her to build up her brand essentially and her ability to connect her clients to add something, add, add a piece of value to, to the scenario that a normal wedding photographer doesn't. Um, Terry's asking about Google Workspace. And honestly, when I worked at e for all they used Google Chat and all the rest yep. of the Google Suite for all of that. Is that. Would that actually qualify as a hub? I was going to put them in here. The catch, it amazes me that they, they've they not, in my experience, found a tool that's, that's as good as some of the other tools that I have up here in the sense that I actually thought in the early days, Google was going to buy Slack before they blew up because they, they've they relied on this email as the base form of communication. And that has kind of gone away over the years. Like we still use email in our business, but it's very quickly a lot, you know, things that we used to do in email, we now do in Slack in terms of it. So I didn't put them on here because another thing with Google, I love Google, but the one caveat is they introduce a tool and then very quickly will kill it after a year or two if it doesn't have the traction they need. And you can see that their messaging is a good example of it. I think they've had five or six different messaging chat systems since then. And I kind of hate that because we have a lot of projects that go for a year, then they pause and they come back a year later. And I would hate to go to my client and say, hey, actually, we moved off of this system. We're on another one now. So that's my only caveat with it. Okay, thanks. Slack, like I was mentioning, you create these channels inside of it and then you can communicate and it's fun and engaging. There's, It's way more dynamic than, a, than an email historically is. And it's so, great for communication. So Phil, if you're a one person business... Do you do you really need a hub? I would say you don't need a communications hub, right? I wouldn't use this, but what I would use is I definitely would use this, like Asana or Trello or uh, Monday or Basecamp would be honestly good examples of just you personally. They become your own digital hub for just yourself, your your own company, a digital company essentially. And that I would create channels maybe to. Uh, to highlight tasks that you have coming up that you might need to do. Like you can schedule automated reminders in Asana is a good example of something that I love from Asana. So if you wanted to every Monday, maybe say you do your bookkeeping, well, instead of adding a to-do task for that every Monday, you can create it once and automate it so that every Monday it, it reappears on your to-do list. Thanks. The next one I hear a lot about is low and no code tools. And honestly, these have gotten really good over the years. There's a few caveats. They do lock you in in many scenarios and you're not going to be able to be as perfectly you know, custom as you want it to be. But if you're willing to give up on those two pieces, I'm a big believer in utilizing some of these tools here. Card is just the lowest and least expensive and easiest way to get up a landing page. I think it's $20 an entire year and that gets you a landing page website for your business. It's a very basic one. If you're very fearful of getting something up and running, 
Card is just a very easy way that you can do it uh, and for not a high cost. Squarespace is the next the more advanced version of that. They, they're drag and drop builders. So basically you can, uh, you know, if you can use and edit the formatting of a Word document, I like to say that you can use a drag and drop builder on the web. So Squarespace is if you want to build your own website and you don't really know how to do it or and you don't want to hire someone for it, if you're willing to spend a couple hours of learning, you'll be able to kind of pick a template and run with that versus Webflow, the next one I'm gonna mention, it's a more advanced version of that. It's still a builder, but it's really built to be much more dynamic and much more customizable. It's still not the perfect one is going custom, but it will get you further than you can probably get with a Squarespace by itself. And both, the reason I put Squarespace and Webflow, cause I could have put a lot of companies here. The reason I put them versus like a, a Weebly or a Wix is in, in my experience, they both are very designer focused, which is the scenario I think a lot of founders don't um, have experience in. They they wanna put a website up, but they want it to look beautiful, but they, but they don't really know how to make a site look beautiful. These companies I think are very design focused. Uh, and then Bubble is the mobile version of these where Inside a bubble, if you want to build a prototype for a mobile app that eventually you deploy to the app store, you can do that inside a bubble. One of the caveats is they do lock you in, right? You can't, if you, if you then want to go and build more on top of it, you're kind of stuck in their platform. So you just got to be kind of cautious with that overall. But my two tools that we use a lot just for, or we, we recommend a lot, Squarespace, this is where I was, I was showing the example where you can pick what type of uh, template you want and run with it from there where you're just editing the content, editing the photo. And then Bubble, this is an example, you could build an app inside a Bubble having no programming experience and even get it to the point that you deploy it to the store. And it's all inside of a drag and drop type of so, builder. Oh, so what happened to WordPress? Yeah, WordPress is excellent, but WordPress, <laughs> is, WordPress is pretty complex actually. And, and it's not very design friendly, right? So in my experience, I, we do a ton of WordPress websites, but it's because we have a development arm to us, right? So 95% uh, of the WordPress projects we've ever worked on have required a developer to be involved. So um, that's just because the client wants something more custom. WordPress, what I love about it, it's free, it's open source, it's well supported. Um, the, the things that, and you can really build a WordPress site and that scales with you over time. You can build smaller web applications on WordPress versus like a Squarespace. I like to say you could create a travel blog on a Squarespace, but if you want to create like a travel explorer, uh, visit New England type website, you're going to struggle to build that on some of the smaller template builders because they're just not going to allow you to make it as custom and as feature rich as you want. So those so, are kind of the trade-offs. All right, let, let me just make sure I, c I can clarify this, is that if I have something that needs a little bit more sophistication than these no-code things, it, it potentially is a one-time get have somebody set up my, my WordPress website, and you can maintain yep. it without knowing code. So it becomes a tool that you can maintain yourself, but it's probably not something you want to set up for yourself. 100%. And okay. what I will say with WordPress versus like a Squarespace is like WordPress is kind of easy for you to, if you don't know what you're doing, to accidentally break something. And then when you break it, you need someone to come back in to help with it a lot of times, unless you're really handy. If you're really handy and you, you, you're willing to put in the 10 hours of YouTube videos to learn WordPress, it's a, it's it, your chances of um, making a mistake that kind of breaks your site is much higher in my experience. Cause and part of that is directly correlated to custom customization. In WordPress, you can create really impressive customized websites. But because of that, if you do break something, you may end up breaking it across your whole site. And that's, uh, I find Squarespace, because they lock you in a little bit more, you have less of a chance of you kind of making something. Yeah, guardrails. Uh, yeah, guardrails. Yeah, it's like bumpers in bowling. I, I love that. <laughs> And then here's some more, more advanced tools. So say you are the person that wants to get into that next level of it. So uh, these tools I find really impressive. Software and Airtable kind of work well together where I mentioned this idea of a website versus a web application. So a website is really a simple blog, a brochure website for your business, right? Maybe you're a restaurant, you just need something with your menu. But like an Airbnb level, that's a web application. That's a much larger type of functionality. And previously, you really couldn't build these with low and no code tools to a, to a impressive degree. That's really changed the last couple of years, I'd say. So these are ones that I do recommend here, specifically inside of mobile. I mentioned Bubble before. 
Flutter is an example where you can build a mobile app in a drag and drop window, but then you can actually say, okay, I'm ready to get outside of this. I'm ready to actually start coding it myself or pass it off to a developer. You can click export and the person gets the code and can run with it versus like bubble. You can't do that. They want you to stay inside their system. And the final one that I use a lot is Zapier. This is like the glue that holds the internet together a lot of times. Um, their whole job is connecting so services together. So I'll, I'll show you them uh, in a second, but Flutterflow, I kind of described drag and drop builder, but then you can export it uh, and you can do applications on it, which which you really couldn't do uh, kind of five years ago and, and have a good experience for the user. Zapier, like I was saying, it connects tools together. So like, say you're running a Facebook marketing campaign, but you want all the people that fill out your form on your ad to go into a Google Sheets document because you're inside of Google Sheets constantly. You can connect those tools with knowing no coding experience. And it's really pretty straightforward. And I think they have something like 5,000 apps now that are inside of their system. So, and I do this to automate a lot of my life. So like, I'll give a good example in uh, where we used to live. I lived right near a grocery store. And it would constantly happen where I'd go to the grocery store, I'd come home and my wife would say, oh, I wish I knew you were there. I, or I forgot there was like three items I wanted you to pick up. So I actually set up a Zapier that was connected to my phone. And it said, anytime my phone is within 50 feet of this, this GPS location, which was the grocery store, it would automatically text my wife and say, hey, do you need anything from the grocery store? And it was just Wait, a very- Can you set it, that up for my husband, please? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. So this is the thing. I love Zapier. I'm, I also, I'm on- the free or low cost tier, I think we may spend 50 bucks a month, but we use it for everything. So a lot of times I find I, I struggle with tools that lock you in or when they start scaling, they get very expensive. Like my experience has been that with HubSpot, which we mentioned earlier. I think they are truly fantastic in what they do, but they're not cheap. They're definitely for an established business. So what I would say is always look at the free tier and how big of a company can you build on the free tiers they give you. Well, and I just want to make one more point is when you're analyzing which softwares that you want, understand their compatibility with others and also know that there's sometimes workarounds. I'll, I'll give you another HubSpot example that's actually a little bit easier to understand, which was mm -hmm. um, HubSpot doesn't have a way when you invite somebody to an event to have an add to my Google calendar, which seems so obvious if, right? Yeah. When you got invited to this forever forward, you want to have the, okay, now I registered for it. Added. So we needed to zap it, to connect it to a MailChimp reminder and a Google calendar. Mm -hmm. And that's when the zaps are really important. Angela is the queen of the zaps here. I love that you're using it. It's also, they talk about the remote work we were talking about before. I'm pretty sure they're still remote. They've been remote the entire time they've been running their business, if I recall correctly, Yeah, for like 15 years. Uh, another thing is you need to track information, right? I think a lot of you do have websites uh, for your businesses. Make sure you have the basic setup. You really, you could do this yourself if you're a little handy. If not, just hire an hour or two someone to, to set these up. But Google Analytics and Google Search Console, if you're getting discovered online in any way, shape, or form, these two tools are kind of critical for you to know what you're doing. Google Analytics is, hey, What's, what happens when someone visits my site? So it's all the information once they get there. Google Search Console, on the other hand, is, hey, what did they do before they got there? How did they find me on Google? What were they searching? Uh, that's, the, that's the difference between those tools. And then SEMrush has a lot of free SEO tools. If you're trying to do an SEO audit on your website and get some quick hits of what you're working uh, on, SEMrush is a great tool to utilize for that. And I always try and find the Amplitude is the mobile version. If you do have a mobile app or something, Amplitude is the analytics platform you'd use. And I used it in some of our first companies to know, hey, how many people were actually downloading the app, then getting to the login screen, and then successfully getting into the app? And I, I saw, hey, actually 80% are dropping off before they get into the app. Well, that tells me maybe our login screen has too much friction on it, or maybe they don't like it for some reason. So the idea is really use this data to improve your business. I use Google Search Console constantly for our business. The reason is like, this shows me how many clicks I'm getting from Google, how many impressions, uh, what's my average positioning uh, uh, on Google. And then the thing I really use it for is I use it as market research. So I can go and see what are the, the top queries that someone typed in to find my business. And I can see, you know, benefits, 
web design, web developer, right? I can see, oh, hey, this is all of it is web versus, hey, we actually have a big mobile side. So maybe we need to put more content out for that. So Google Search Console is great. Both of these are tools that you kind of add a little snippet of code to your website. And then once they're on, once that snippet of code is there and validated, it'll start pulling this data automatically into your system. Graphic design, I think a lot of you might be using. A big thing is like you know, creating beautiful visual assets for your business. And there's a lot of tools that do this now. Marvel is a great tool if you want to create like a prototype, a clickable prototype, if you're going to show people something. Canva is a great way to actually just mock up and do designs. If you have a social media ad campaign you're trying to run, they have pre-built templates that work fantastically well, very easy to use. And I really recommend Canva to a ton of people. I, I've not... Um, seen their payment system if it's gone up recently, but I just found that I could do, a lot of people can do a lot of stuff on Canva for really free. And now that they're integrating a lot of the AI tools, it's, it's even more impressive to me. And then if you start working with an actual designer, Figma is one of the biggest tools that, you, that, that has exploded over the years. This is more advanced, right? This is someone, if, you, if you're working with the designer, they might be using Figma and then you'll be, you'll be adding comments into the Figma file of where you want them to change certain things. And then the last thing I'll touch on, which I figured this might be some of the questions today, is ChatGPT. I'd love if you could drop in the chat if you've actually used ChatGPT physically or you've just, you know, I want to know if you've physically used it because I find a lot of people hear about it, but they've not physically used it yet. And, it, and I'd love to maybe demo that and show how helpful it can be in your business. Canva is the one that we use a lot. It's just pre-built templates that look beautiful. Bill, do you think that there's still a reason to have Adobe uh, you know, the Adobe Photoshop suite. I mean, I know one of the things it does that I have not figured out a workaround on is fillable PDFs. Like Canva mm -hmm. can't do them because Adobe owns this PDF creation. Yeah. That's a great point because that's definitely a limitation. Like Adobe has that in their ecosystem, right? The the PDF filling. So in my mind, it's a scenario where you, you can definitely go and use it. I'd also say use what you're familiar with, right? I still use for photo editing this open source software called GIMP that uh, is a basically a, a rip of, it's an open source version of Photoshop and it works for me. And I've been using it for, you know, probably 10 years now, even though it's not as advanced, stay with, with stay inside of what you know, but also still experiment in the sense of like your day-to-day, day-to-day tool, keep using that day-to-day -day one, but then also don't be afraid to just like, watch a video on it or like look i would look up adobe versus canva inside of uh youtube and just see if that that video probably perfectly summarizes the the pros and cons of each software and then kind of get into ChatGPT. this is a perfect example where the disclaimer that we saw earlier is there i'm really not telling you to 100 percent go and do this all the time there's there is a lot of legal questions nowadays on what you can and cannot use from it, but I just did an example. Can you design for me a social media image to use to highlight my upcoming Cinco de Mayo party at my restaurant, right? This was created in four seconds. So this, this is a scenario where a lot of founders, I think in the early days, they don't put out content or they don't build their business in, in a certain area because they think it's going to be super time intensive. And I'm a big believer, like, how can you, how can you make it a little easier to get, get up and running um, in terms of the system? And then I like to say for getting discovered, don't try and be on every social media platform. Pick and choose the ones that you think is the best way to reach your customers. And then you need to monitor those results essentially. So for example, Google My Business, I think is a fantastic tool for probably everyone in this room from what I heard from you all. These are all, this is a way for you to be discovered on Google way more than it used to be. It used to be all about Google search engine optimization, which is your website. Well, now Google wants to keep you inside their own platform. So they've been bumping up Google places in their listing of results. And my business, for example, has 30% of our business actually comes from our Google listing of people just searching for mobile app developers near me and, and we show up for them. It's not our website. It's our Google place listing. Even then I always recommend- Even though you don't have an actual physical place? Yep. They allow for services business. You have to set a, a services region of where you, where you operate within. But yep, Google allows you to have a services business, even if you don't have a physical, you will need a, sorry, you will need an address listed. So the address is listed as my house, which isn't, you know, the most ideal scenario, but at the end of the day, it's worked really well for us. And it's worth that, that trade-off of like, no one's ever going to show up because the way we portray ourselves, no one shows up to that location to meet us or anything like that. Versus if you are a different type of business that, yeah, maybe that's the, the question. And I'll kind of show you our specific example from from us. 
And then LinkedIn has definitely exploded. I know all of you probably use it. I would say specifically on B2B. If you're doing something in B2B sales, think of building a LinkedIn um, uh, following and or just participate in the community because a lot of your business might come from people directly in your own network. Well, don't be afraid to do that. Don't do it in a spammy way, right? Like I'm a, I hate when people just send you a contact out of nowhere and I'm like, I don't like, I, I'm not going to accept this. I don't necessarily know you. But if I've met you and have a conversation with you, I, I totally want to be in your network on these platforms. I put TikTok because a lot of newer, uh, like a lot of digital marketing is going to this platform because there's just such a swell of user base over the years. Big believer in it. Uh, I've not personally run business ads on it because it's not my target demographic, but it's something that I've seen successfully. If you have a consumer based product, might be a great way to do it. Um, uh, Cindy, I believe it was you run a, you know, an art, uh, you, you're an artist and have you have many products for sale. I've purchased multiple items of art from a artist on in, uh, Instagram reels that I, that I found that was doing very impressive art and it was behind the scenes. So I got to watch how he was creating these items. And then I've now bought multiple pieces from him and he, he's kind of exploded. And it's, it's crazy because I only found him because I saw a reel of him behind the scenes uh, when he posted, posted about, I just quit my job to go full time at this. I have a new style of art. I want to pioneer. That's what got it popular. And then Hootsuite is just, if anyone struggles with social media automation, like Hey, I just get overwhelmed because like, I do want to post on three different platforms, but I know that can be that that's time consuming to do them one by one. Hootsuite is a good tool where if you, if you do have content that you think can be replicated across uh, uh, channels, well, yeah, you could do that. Uh, and I would just say, you know, pick and choose the ones that you think are most pertinent for your business overall. Hootsuite is an ex example where I do think you get out of the free tier pretty quickly and it can get expensive though. And with Google My Business as an example, like if you search mobile app developers, Providence, Rhode Island, right, we show up as one of the top results because of the Google Maps location. You can see below it is actually clutch.co, which is a review website for companies like myself. But we're showing above that just because we have this here. Um, big believer in leveraging uh, Google My Business. And, and a lot of this, we can do a whole segment on just how to do that. <laughs> And I threw in some extras. We have like 20 some, uh, we got a good bit of time left, but I threw in some extras just to, just to, you know, go through. I didn't want to put them in specific categories. Upwork is a great website. If you need to find talent, you need to find someone that helps you with a WordPress website. You need to find someone that technology, um, does grab. Technology related, right? So somebody um, could help you implement HubSpot in your organization or whatever, implement right? Implement HubSpot. But then I believe they even do, I have not used it, but I believe you could find like, um, I believe there's probably CTO or sorry, uh, CMOs on this platform that are doing consultant work. If you want to hire a part-time CMO or like a, a CFO, you could find probably it's, it's people for hire, right. To clarify, but I believe you can find a lot of different types. It started very uh, IT and development heavy, but then it moved into marketing design. There's a lot of things that you could, if you want to find a virtual assistant overseas in the Philippines, which is very common nowadays, um, you can do it. And I, I find that this is a good tool to at least get your pulse of what it's going to probably cost, right? Because you can go on here and just search profiles and feel like, hey, if I do want to hire a developer out of this area, what's my average cost going to be? And then compare that to I'm going to look up uh, a different region. And then that that's a good researching tool for you. Especially if there's an area of your business that you really want to work on but you don't have the skills at your, your, your own time. My key with Upwork is interview a ton of people because it's very common to get burned in these scenarios. So just make sure you're interviewing tons of people when you're looking into these things. And then I'm a big believer in, I YouTube everything. If you'd scroll through my YouTube, you'd be blown away the, the rabbit holes that I've gone down, where if you do need to learn how to add a Google search console snippet to your Squarespace site, you can throw it into Google and there's a tutorial right there. Um, I, I learned, I, I liked, I never went to school for programming. I never went to school for business. Essentially, I, I essentially learned a lot of this through the YouTube education. So I'm a big believer in um, people putting out great content. And this could be a way too to highlight your business. If you think you're a service, I mean, I've hired a lawyer that I had followed their content for about a year prior that um, uh, talked about how to setting up businesses to optimize for taxes. And I ended up hiring them as a yeah, lawyer. All right, so, so Phil, one of the things I want to just put a pin in right here is that you're obviously a quick study. You could watch a video and learn something. 
so for instance, at an Entrepreneurs Forever, we're talking about, should we be editing these videos of these webinars to put up? And I mm -hmm. just know that even if I took a whole week's class in video editing, I'm not yeah. going to be good at it. Like yeah. I should just hire someone else. How do you sort of weigh the, should I learn yeah. this tool or should I just hire somebody? It's a bit, in my mind, what it always comes down to is I think of my current resources that I have at hand, right? I find a lot of founders don't do this really well, which is, hey, maybe you're working full-time, so you have some revenue that you that you, that you you want to pay for it, but you have no time because you're working full-time in a different business. That's a perfect scenario to hire, right? Find a talented person, and then you're paying them for their time and their knowledge, right? Uh, so it's really three things, sorry. It's, it's um, time, it's money, and it's knowledge, right? Because if you and I both tried to do the same thing, right? Like I don't edit videos, uh, you know, versus someone who does my, it'll take me, I'll probably do it, but it'll take me 20 hours to that one video versus hiring one person who can probably do it in two. So that's a big scenario. I, I kind of equate, what do you have for you as a current resource? And what do you want to, what are you willing to spend on? Are you willing to spend your time, your money, or your, you, you know, essentially your knowledge to go out and do it yourself? Fair enough. And then the thing I, I recommend for like a lot of people don't always realize that a lot of the government pools nowadays, if you're building your company, it's a new idea. Well, like you probably want to make sure that you're protected in terms of your brand, right? If you want to eventually go get a trademark for your, your basic name, you want to make sure you're checking that out before you build the entire company, right? Because if you build the entire company and then two years later, you find out like, oh, someone else has a patent on, or has a trademark on that name. Well, like I can't really use that, or at least at a scale, I won't be able to use it unless they're in a different industry. This is a great tool that you can go online. Uh, they've updated their their interface since this, uh, but basically you can do a basic word search and then type the name of your company and see if it comes up without any results. And then if it comes up with results, you just have to check, are those results in my same category? So it's the exact example why there can be a um, Apple computers, right? But there can also be an Apple uh, that's a grocery store because they're not they're the same name but they're in different industries. So so the you you can have that legally. You can get a trademark in both of those scenarios separately. So definitely leverage that. ClickUp is a newer tool. It actually combines Trello and Slack together, which I kind of love. I think I've seen Asana has been starting to do this as well. But one thing I'll say is I've been pretty amazed with how much the free tier gets you inside of here. And these guys, if I were to restart my company today, I actually would probably be using these guys instead of right now. I am kind of locked into Slack and Trello because I've been just using them for so long. I don't want to abandon all that information. So that goes mm -hmm. to a really interesting uh, point about the switching costs. So if yeah. you invest all of the time and energy into learning a software, moving all your data there, it's really hard to switch. I mean, as you just said, you, you think this is better technology, but you're so invested in the other. So those are things to think totally. about as you're at the beginning of, of making these decisions. And that's why I really do say, don't be afraid to test things out, but then don't don't immediately jump into them and say, I'm going to move everything. I have friends of ours that every every year and a half, they move their entire systems to a new system. And I'm like, this just breaks the continuity of your business so much because it it's it's data is lost. So if I hire a new person and they need to go look up something for me, they don't know which system to go check in. So I definitely recommend spending a lot of time. I, I watch a lot of YouTube videos where I say like click up pros and cons. And then I watch those videos because those will help me understand what are the limitations that I might run into with this business. And then SurveyMonkey we use for concept testing for customer discovery. If you have an idea for building something or, or getting, you know, I have an idea for a new business for gift giving, right? Like you mentioned the gift giving business. Uh, this could be an example where you set up a survey because you're trying to figure out maybe the average price someone would want to spend for a gift. Well, the thing I love is for a couple hundred bucks, you can create this survey and then you can set up this qualifying question, which is like, have you purchased a gift for someone else in the last X months, right? Then what you do is essentially that question gets served to a bunch of people. And if they do say, yes, they have, well, then they get served your actual survey. So I love that this is a good way to get actual uh, results from people who really are in your market. And then you can always ask in the final step, if you'd be comfortable listing your email, then you can always have this bit built in group that you could reach out to if you want to expand from there. And, and essentially I want to save there's time. There's a free, to, free oh, yeah. tier of that too. Yep. Free. Oh yeah. And serve, to clarify, Survey Monkey is the surveying piece, but then there, there's this like marketing research piece, which is kind of what this is. And I really do like this because this is 
this is a scenario where it's like that you can pay for them to go deliver your survey to oh, other people rather than rather than it being only people that you email it out to, right? Like this is something where, hey, I want to, I'm interested in building this business, but should I invest in this area? Maybe people don't all have the same uh, issues that I have. This is a great way to just go do some quick testing. Right. And so you're reaching people who don't already know you, which is hugely exactly. valuable. That I did not know they did that. That's great. You know, it's it's very undiscovered part of it, but I, I've loved it. And some of our clients have used it before they've gone and done development and built something because they're like, hey, is this going to be worth it for me? And then the last tool I end with is just a fun tool. This is like a digital whiteboard, if you think in an office. And I really do love it. Miro's expanded a ton. They do, they, they've built their company way bigger now. But if you just want a quick, like, if you're, if you're constantly someone drawing on a whiteboard at your office, Miro is a digital version of that. And to my point that I mentioned about Google, Google introduced Jamboard to compete with this. And within a year and a half, they ended Jamboard. So all of my old Jamboards that I was using on some of my calls are no longer there. So uh, I just highly recommend uh, looking in and finding the tool that you think is going to stick with you long term. It's like having and eight, I, I eight track right. tapes, right? What is that? It's like having eight track tapes. There's no player <laughs> anymore. <laughs> yep, exactly. You don't want to get stuck in something that doesn't grow with you over time or the, the community leaves behind, essentially. And I'll leave the QR code up on screen, but I figure we can kind of transition into more direct questions. I'm going to take a peek through the messages real through the messages. Okay. Actually, quick. leave the leave your contact info up. Remember, I'm going to send yep. everyone these slides too. So okay. um, if anyone wants to get in touch with Phil, that's how to do that. Um, he's I'm going to stop recording and he's going to dive into like, what do you want him to show you? I'd love to see click up and why you think it's great, but let's see what other people want to do. Um, and uh, I love Terry. I love your slide there about AI.